All right, so just started the recording. Um, we have a few things that we're going to talk about. I made a list. Um, so to start, we'll sort of go through like the process. We'll start with more of like EDA things. We'll start with data cleaning actually first. The first thing we're going to talk about is software removal. Then we'll talk about EDA and like all the things that you can consider while doing EDA. Um, and then um, we'll talk about, you know, if you're doing positive, negative, how can we get neutral results out of that? Um, so to start with stopper removal basically comes in your data cleaning process. Stopper removal comes after tokenization usually. Um, and then you're just filtering out words that are not useful. Um, to start, um, NLTK has a stop words library. So if you just download their stop words library, let me just zoom in a little bit here. We download their stop words library. And then if we do the stop words removal here, we can use our set of stop words. Um, several ways to go about this. First, you can honestly, you can um, filter out stop words manually. So you can see here, I'm, I'm doing some sort of um, for loop to just say if it's not the stop word, um, if it is not the stop word, then keep it. If it is stop word, we don't need that. But additionally, uh, you can include stop word removal in your, in your vectorizers. So this is more for the bag of words methods um, because stop words matter more if you're using a bag of words method versus word embeddings. Um, so you can include stop words in count vectorizer. I believe you can also do so in TFIDF. So they actually have their own stop words, but you can actually feed it in like a list of stop words. So here, even though I say English, because count vectorizer has, um, it takes in its own languages, I believe you can feed it in a, and like any iterable with stop words. Let me just double check with TFIDF. So here with stop words, let's double check. Yeah, you can give it a list of your stop words. Now, the default stop words are all of these. Where was it earlier? It has a bunch of default stop words, but again, depending on your context, you might want to include other stop words. Like, for example, I know with the phase four project, there was a lot of like South by Southwest, uh, like product names you might want to take out. Um, so you can definitely add to this stop word and you can add to stop words by literally, um, this is in a set. Um, I think it um, by default is as a list. So you can literally just like append new words to that list. And if you're trying to think about, all right, what should be considered a stop word or not, um, that is usually hand in hand with your EDA. So for example, when you're looking at your EDA, either if you're doing it like as a whole or comparative between your classes for your classification problem, if you're seeing a lot of like meaningless words, um, overall, if you're seeing meaningless words, just add them to your um, stop word list. Also, if you're doing a comparative EDA and a word occurs with the same proportion across both classes, it is less likely to be helpful for um, your classification model. So that could be something that you can add to your stop word list as well. Is there an automated way to do this? You could code something to really look at, you know, the similarity in proportion of stop words of, of your words between all of your classes, but I would say with stop words and for most models, having extra words won't harm it too much. So based on that, um, I would say, I think just doing it manually um, and just like looking at, honestly, you can even do it by looking at your word clouds um, or by looking at like your frequency distribution. That I would say is the, the way that I would go about doing it, just because you want to be somewhat involved in what you're removing. And if you're writing a function, you might not catch, you might remove words that you don't want to remove just by however you set up your function. So yeah, that's on stop words. Again, you would think about removing stop words only if you're using bag of words methods, which all of you should be starting out with. Um, so yeah, if you're using like count vectorizer or TFIDF vectorizer in your models for your modeling, then you want to definitely get rid of stop words. If you're doing word vectorizing, I would say it does depend on what kind of vectorizing you're doing. Um, if you're gonna vectorize it word by word, you might be able to get rid of stop words. Some stop words don't even have word vectors. Um, so you can definitely do it like case by case, what kind of vectorizing you're doing. But 
if you're doing something like document vectors, like I talked about with Stacy, hopefully this notebook loads up so I don't have to pull it up. All right, no worries. Oh, perfect. So if I'm doing something like Spacey, and I don't know why this notebook is so long, so something like Spacey. Anyways, so Spacey will vectorize an entire sentence at the same time. So if you remove stop words from something that you want to feed into Spacey, um, you might, I don't know, make the meaning a little bit, you might change the meaning of a sentence and the way it becomes embedded um, if you do that. So yeah, as an example, real quick, um, this is what I mean by like Spacey's uh, embeddings. Um, it's like a little bit slow, but yeah. Using Spacey, the entire document, so like the entire tweet, the entire review will be thrown to its own vector and like this inclusion or exclusion of stop words will change the vector. Um, so do take that into account. Um, all right, I, I will talk about like going from EDA to modeling as well. Um, so I'll go into more detail about this a little bit later. But yeah, any like other thoughts regarding data cleaning for text or stop words? Uh, the data cleaning should exactly must, for example, we should do it before the modeling or we can exactly doing it in the model itself, for example, mm -hmm. uh, because you know that I designed a positive negative ratio that it can determine which word is not useful for the model and it can drop it out. Yeah, so I will say for NLP, especially if you're doing something like that, where you will change your model based on, change your de data based on your model, um, it's definitely flexible to that. There are no rules that say that you have to segment your project into data cleaning, EDA modeling. Um, so based on that, yeah, you're definitely not, you can definitely go back and redo your data cleaning with your modeling results. Um, also for, as we'll, we're gonna talk about going from EDA into modeling, uh, there's gonna be a lot of back and forth because annoyingly some functions work well with tokens, some functions work well with entire sentences. So you're going to see a lot of back and forth of like splitting into tokens, re-putting everything back into like long strings just based on what methods you want to use. Um, so yeah, there is, I would say like most people who do NLP, their notebook, uh, their notebooks have, even if they do have like data cleaning and EDA separate and even modeling, there is a lot of like going back to like, all right, based on this result, let's clean out this again and then rerun. Um, so yeah, you're definitely not restricted to the segmentation of your notebook for sure. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Anything else? Uh, you mentioned removing stop words that uh, might be like evenly found on both classes, but if they're like mm -hmm. mostly evenly found, then is leaving them in really going to impact the model? Like, won't yeah. It not very. You're right. It's not going to impact your model very much. I would say I would really only looking look into doing this if you really want to cut down the, uh, the number of uh, columns that you have in your bag of words uh, for your bag of words data. Yeah. But that's a good point. Um, yeah, if they're spread out evenly, one, if you keep them in, they just, if you like, for example, take your most important features, it's not gonna be important at all. So there is an argument saying that like, um, based on doing your most important features, you can actually cut out a good number of your columns without affecting your model adverse adversely by too much, um, just so your models will run and predict faster. Um, so yeah, that could be another thing that you do in terms of like, you know, EDA modeling, um, based on modeling results, cut out a bunch of like not so useful words and then refit your model with fewer columns. That's something you could do, but yeah, take into account um, the time it takes for your model to run if, you, if you're thinking of like a, a workflow like that. All right, thank you. Nice, anything else before we move on to talk about EDA? All right, so um, I think you all are doing some form of classification uh, and also some, I think LDA is also something that, I want, uh, that I'm gonna talk about. So 
I'm going to talk about first EDA as a whole and then EDA for classification. So when you're doing EDA as a whole, it's really you trying to learn as much as you can about your entire um, data set. Um, I would say, and a lot of these things will actually apply to classification as well. Uh, but you know, the typical things that you have are frequency distributions, word clouds, maybe you want to do like an overall topic modeling to see what the most salient topics are across, you know, all of your classes in your data. Uh, just because in some topic modeling um, with LDA, it doesn't, it might not pick out positive and negative to be different, um, different clusters, if that makes sense. Um, so you could see what the topic modeling results are as a whole. Um, so question with, um, aren't frequency distributions and word clouds basically doing the same thing? Yeah. Just visually representing them in a different way. Yeah, exactly. Okay. They're doing the same thing. Um, and then, I would say, mm -hmm. go ahead. No, it's just with LDA, do you actually like have to come up with the topics yourself? I don't really understand that part. Like it'll give you the words, right? That yeah. would be clustered together. And then you would decide on like the topic that that goes under or? That's right. Yeah. Okay. I'll talk about LDA in a little more in a bit more detail later, but yeah, they'll okay. show you like what are the most salient words within each topic, but you are the one that ends up saying like, all right, Sounds. I'll call this the, I don't know, the whatever. Yeah, you, you right. name, you'll name the clusters uh, manually. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so now more specifically for classification, um, especially if you want your EDA to inform your model, you want to look at, you want to do a comparative EDA. And this goes for any sort of classification problem, right? Um, so with NLP, doing a comparative EDA um, will give you insights as to how your model will perform, what are likely to be important features versus not important features. Um, so again, at like, I think at the simplest level, as long as you all have some sort of frequency distribution per class that you have, maybe even a word cloud for your presentation. Um, that honestly will be kind of good enough. One thing that you can look at, and I think Ali, you showed me that you had that. Um, one thing that you can look at is like the word proportion. So like if you take your value counts and then you normalize them uh, and see which ones have the biggest difference across the two classes, uh, the ones with the bigger difference will likely be more important features for your model versus um, having similar uh, normalized value counts, if that makes sense. So uh, you just mm -hmm. are you you're trying to say then like if one word is used much more frequently or in like greater proportion in one class than like that word in the other class, then that would mm -hmm. be a better indicator. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Yep, that's right. Um. So how much EDA you, do you want to do? Um, I think for, um, for the capstone, it really depends on how, like, how many other components exist um, in your project. And honestly, it is quite subjective what constitutes a capstone. Um, I would say that if you are doing, um, if your project on its own with a normal EDA looks a lot like a phase four project, I would just do more EDA. And by more EDA, honestly, including LDA counts as more EDA because doing like any sort of clustering method is illuminating things that you won't immediately see from your, um, just based on your, your text itself. So I think as long as you're including LDA, that's kind of already like a level up of your, um, of the EDA that you could do. Um, so with respect to LDA, um, and actually, let me just scroll down to the LEA part of this notebook. Hopefully, it's not too far away. And oh my gosh, what is this? Wow. Sorry, guys. Bear with me for a little bit. Okay, there we go. Um, so this is the LDA results. Um, there is this LDA viz that I really, really do recommend because it just makes everything easier to see. Um, this was the, I think it's the satire data set, if I'm not wrong. 
And then this just has four topics where you have, you know, the topic zero has all of these words. Topic one has these words that basically represent the, um, the cluster. And yeah, as Sarah mentioned, um, it's up to you to name these. And also, like I talked about in the clustering session, um, if you feel like two of these or three of these are very, very similar to each other, feel free to, you know, just manually um, refer to them as the same cluster. So you can just say like, all right, out of my six clusters, like one and five are very similar. So I'm going to just consider one and five to be the same cluster. So you can definitely do that if you feel like um, it's necessary. Um, for, for topic modeling for a comparative EDA, um, it will take a little bit of time to run again. This is also depending on the size of your data, but I think it would be very illuminating to do an LDA per each class that you have. An LDA for each class that you have, and with reviews, for example, if you have positive and negative, you can see what people are talking about in positive reviews and what people are talking about in negative reviews. And usually through this EDA step, you're able to create uh, or come up with you know, business recommendations for whatever your product is about. Because you can, usually from this, you can um, infer the things that people don't like about like a game or a product. Um, yeah, just based on that, that's why I think LD, LDA is a really, really good model to include. Uh, it does take a bit of work setting up and this also will, um, when we talk about, you know, bringing your EDA, going from EDA to modeling, um, just because LDA does take your data in a specific data type. And as you can see here, it's like lists, a list of lists of tokens. That's the data type for LDA. Um, but yeah, that's again, to say like the kind of annoying part, part about NLP is that every model or like different models or different methods take in your text data in different forms. So you just have to be, um, one, look at documentation to see, or examples to see what kind of data format your text needs to be in. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of adapting back and forth in different data formats for different parts of your project, which is very, very normal. So that list of lists, then each list within the list would represent like a separate text document, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then yeah. you would just have each token, I guess, as part of the list. Yep. Okay, and then you yeah. could run it can run it through that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, feel free to take the code from here. Um, I think this is adapted from a Medium article that is adapted from, I think, the LDA uh, documentation. Okay. So feel free to take this yeah. code. Um, I will say also with LDA, because you're doing LDA more for uh, data exploration rather than you're actually going to use the results of your LDA, um, you don't really have to do too much tuning. Usually, whatever the, um, the defaults are will work. And I'm not sure if these are the defaults specifically, but not too important. I think whatever the uh, hyperparameters are, um, they're not gonna change too many of your data points clusters. I think the only thing you have to decide on is how many clusters, um, which I would say run it a couple of times. I would say also based on what your context is, how many topics do you envision could be a place to start? Uh, but LDA as a model does take a bit of time to run. So I wouldn't spend too much time. I'd say just pick a number. If you see that cluster are close together, just um, just go with the fact that, all right, we'll take cluster two and four to be the same cluster rather than rerunning the whole thing, unless you have time to do that. Um, so yeah, any other questions on EDA before I talk about transitioning into modeling? All right, I think, yeah, EDA is very, very underrated, especially as we're learning like machine learning and all this like more, I guess, interesting stuff. But uh, with a good EDA, you illuminate a lot of things and it will sort of confirm a lot of things that you see as your modeling results. So yeah, there's that. Okay, as we transition into modeling, um, just remember that this whole process of converting I guess the main process going from EDA into modeling is converting your text data into numerical, some numerical representation of it. Um, just as like an overall recap, there are two main ways of, I guess, pre-processing techniques that we talked about, bag of words methods and word vectors. 
So bag of words methods, um, the way I remember which ones are bag of words methods is as long as every column represents a word. And as you can see with it in this way, um, the order of the words don't matter. I think automatically if you use like TFIDF or even count vectorizer, it just does it alphabetically. Um, so as long as you have something that has, you know, all of your individual words as columns, it is a bag of words method. Um, so with that, the vectorizer does have stop words, as I mentioned before, the vectorizer does have a, an argument that can take in stop words, which again, kind of complicates things in a way because you can remove stop words at the start, but you can also do that at, at the end here. Um, so it really depends on when you want to do it. it there is no like, I think because NLP is so new, there isn't, there aren't any like standard practices of doing NLP ana analysis. Um, so yeah, therefore, um, just be aware that, yeah, these are bag of words methods and you can also remove stop words in this process. For bag of words methods, uh, what kind of data does the vectorizer take in? The vectorizer actually takes in rows of, uh, rows of text. So for vectorizers, especially if you're using the, I know there are other vectorizers in other libraries, but the main one that we talked about is NLTK. So for NLTK, um, the vectorizer just takes in uh, text like that. Let me see if I have a different example. I guess not, but basically it doesn't take in tokens. I think some people think that because every column is a word that you need tokens, but it actually does the tokenization for you. Um, so yeah, you don't need to have, uh, yeah, you need your, you need it to look like this basically. And then this is what you can feed in to your vectorizer, either count vectorizer be, or your TFIDF. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that could be after um, after you've already tokenized and lemmatized it, you can put it back together in just a string. Yeah. So it were yeah. like a normal sentence and then it will tokenize it again, I guess. Yeah. Into each of its own columns and each column is a word and each row is a document. And then it just represents like how many times the word would come up if you're using count vectorizer and then TFIDF, like the inverse frequency or something. Yep, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, basically if you've like gotten rid of stop words already and if you've already done a little bit of clean, like for example, if you do like all the lowercase, um, all you have to do is from your tokens, you can just do like a dot join and it'll put it all back together in a string for it to go into the vectorizer again. Um, yeah, I think it's just the fact that like um, these were created not knowing what kind of formats of text people are dealing with. So I think this is the fact that, you know, this kind of does everything even though you don't want everything to be done at this stage. Um, yeah, that's just the way it is. Okay. Um, so yeah. When you do fit transform on the docs, that's going to give you, what, what is that going to output, I guess? Mm -hmm. So it outputs a, um, it kind of outputs a sparse array to begin. To begin okay. with. So that's why you have to do, I think this does two array, but I think if you do like two dense, the same thing, it's the same thing. And then you can put it into a data frame as well. Um, you actually don't need to put into a data frame. If you have a lot of text, Actually, not putting it to a data frame might be better because um, um, because data frames will make your notebook run slower. Because when you render a data frame, or if you are storing a data frame, it can take up a lot more memory than if you just have it as an array. So if you find that your notebook's getting slow because of you know maybe you have like thousands of columns and tens of thousands of rows, uh, you can actually keep it as like x dot two array and feed that into the model. That actually will work as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, what as about I was, your mm -hmm. classes, I guess. Yeah. Are those, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, keep going. <laughs> all good. All good. So, your classes, the order of your rows will always be the same. Um, none of these will shuffle, shuffle the order of your rows. So, really, you, I think most people for this, they actually keep their X and Y separate and then they just okay. join, or actually, you don't even need to join them because they go into your model separate, anyways. Right. Uh, so but you yeah. Would just, have a Y that has all the different classes is like a, a list, I guess, basically. And then you're going to have your data frame, which has 
all the corresponding documents and they should still be in the same order, right? That's that's right. Unless I none of these functions will shuffle the order of um of your rows. Um, okay. So yeah, you don't you wouldn't have to worry about that. Okay, cool. Um, one more thing that I actually just thought about is to prevent data leakage, um, because this is just X, there's actually no train test split being done here. Let me see if there is, whether this is being done here. There we go. Okay, so this is just one example. Um, fit transform on your train set and transform on your test set. Um, I will say that it, is more important to do to make sure that you're doing this for TF-IDF, uh, but for count vectorizer, because you know you're just taking the word counts. Um, basically, if your test set has like a word that isn't in your train set, it wouldn't be turned into a column. Does that make sense? So yeah, to prevent data leakage, even for your vectorizers, fit transform on your train and only transform on your test. Um, one pretty neat thing, and for those of you who are using like the scikit-learn models, you can actually, if you're doing, uh, if you all are interested in doing like the scikit-learn pipeline, the count vectorizer or TF-IDF vectorizer can actually be a step in your scikit-learn pipeline. So if you don't want to have to like keep reminding yourself of like when to do this and like, I don't know, if you don't want to have like multiple data frames like lying around of different versions, you can consider just having it as a step in a pipeline and then they will remember when to do which for you. Ish, I have a question about mm -hmm. uh, if we want to use traditional machine learning algorithms, we should do this, right? Yes. But I'm using, for example, neural network mm -hmm. and I'm using vector instead of data frame for mm -hmm. my input data. So uh, what should I do if I want to implement TF-IDF? Ooh, good question. For TF-IDF, I would say even in your neural network, you have a train and a test, right? So yeah. because TF-IDF, you are calculating the score based on all of your documents in your train set, just make sure that you're doing that. And then for your test set, you would have to transform those numbers based on the inverse document frequency part of your train set. So I think, hold on, let me see. I think I have the formula for TF-IDF here somewhere. Okay, so this part is just the IDF part. Oh, where is it? Hold on, there we go. So this is the IDF part. And then you would just take your term frequency of your test data point, um, multiply by this. But then this number, should come from your um, should come from your train set, if that makes sense. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you might have to like store a lot of values as a result. So um, also, if in your test set you have a word that wasn't in your train set, you would actually not even consider that word um, to be fed into your model. Yeah, that's what I think. Awesome. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Um, so that's the bag of words methods. Any questions or clarification on like these bag of words methods before I talk about word vectorizing? Um, my only still confusion is like how you implement pipelines with these things. And mm -hmm. like, if we could have an example of that, it doesn't have to be like now, but yeah. At, some point of like how you would properly apply a pipeline to just do all those steps for you, I guess. Yeah, so I, I, I you saw me just Google this. So I think, there we go. Let me see. I don't know why you would use both of, oh, right. Okay, I see. So no, I why is it both, I guess? So yeah. <laughs> At first glance, I thought so too, but there is actually a TF-IDF transformer that's different from TF-IDF vectorizer. Okay. So if you want, so two of these steps combined are, is equivalent to the TF-IDF vectorizer. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, in a pipeline, this is how you would set it up. Um, okay. If you have like specific like stop words, you would feed them into 
these as you instantiate your pipeline as well. And then um, where's the train test split part going on, I guess? Mm -hmm. So the train test split happens outside of the pipeline. So okay. you have your X chain, X chain, X test, Y chain, Y test. And okay. when you do your like, for your pipeline, you would actually do pipeline.fit, right? Right. So you do pipeline.fit on your train set and then pipeline.predict on your test set. And it knows automatically, especially if these intermediate steps all come from scikit-learn, it mm -hmm. automatically knows what to do with those steps. Okay. So you would first split everything into train test split and then you would fit your pipeline to your training data, mm -hmm. basically, with, I yep. guess, like the different classifiers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me see if there's a different example. Let's see. So they did train test split here. And yeah, you can see that this is their pipeline. They have like their vectorizer and then their classifier. You mm -hmm. just do, and this is their bag of words pipeline. You just do your pipeline.fit and then pipeline.predict. And then you can get all your metrics from that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would say like as you're uh, testing all of your different models, sometimes it makes sense to do a pipeline, sometimes it doesn't. Um, I would say if you're testing like the difference between count vectorizer and TFI, TFIDF vectorizer, then maybe setting up two pipelines or honestly, you can also loop through your pipeline and edit. I mean, there's many of it, uh, there's no like set workflow to test it. So I would say for pipelines, use them if you're comfortable with them. I wouldn't, I would, I wouldn't say that like creating the scikit-learn pipeline is, is definitely not a necessity, but it's an option so that you don't have to keep track of all of your different like tables that you're creating. You can um, also come up with your own function if you like to. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So um, actually I was going to talk about this when we talk about front ends, but um, I actually prefer to write my own pipeline because I like to make like small edits on, for example, I don't want to just vectorize it straight up. I also want to like subset like specific words and things like that. So I actually, for my NLP project that I did, I actually wrote my own pipeline, not using scikit-learn, but it's just a function that will take in text and like clean it the way I want it, um, vectorize it the way I want it and so on and so forth. But I'll talk about that when we get to like productionalizing models and creating a front end next week. All right, um, let's talk about, oh, we have to talk about word vectors. Um, so with word vectors, I talked about two libraries that you can use to do word vectorization. And again, the big difference between word vectors and bag of words methods is that word vectors take context into consideration, which may or may not work better. Like I think Andrew, you talked about yesterday how your, uh, your word vectors actually performed worse than your TFIDF model. Uh, but uh, just as a quick overview of word vectors, two main libraries you can use, GenSim. And from GenSim, um, you can get word vectors. So a vector for every word. And if you have a document like a tweet or a review, you can just aggregate your word vector just by adding them together. Um, I think what is more preferred now, so there's the library Spacey that is, I think is newer than GenSim, but it has a lot of like pipelines that are, that just make it easier to use word vectors. Um, for Spacey, I like Spacey because you just have to load in which vector, which set of vectors you want to use. Um, and then all you have to do is do like a, um, an, and apply function and it does it all automatically for you. Um, and the big difference between the two is that GenSim is using specific word vectors that are just aggregated, whereas Spacey takes into account more of the order of your words. So usually if you just wanna dive into one of them, I would recommend Spacey just because, you know, the pipeline is easier. You don't have to worry about, um, oh yeah. And just the fact that it takes into account your order of words, like, yeah. Um, one thing to remember with Spacey is if you have stop words, might be better not to remove them because you want to maintain that information, if you want to maintain that information. So I guess, where's like the, you have raw in here with Spacey, so where is like the vectorized format of? Yeah, it's actually all here. It is actually all here. 
Um, so these are each now spacey objects. So if I see like my, so this is just the first row under mm -hmm. here. So the type of this whole thing is actually a document vector. Oh, sorry, to get the vector, you would have to do, sorry, it's lagging a little bit. But yeah, if I just do dot vector, you get it all here. So you can actually just write a function or write um, like an, a dot apply that would extract all of these vectors okay. for each document. So the NLP so, is going to put it in the spacey format, and then you would do a dot vector to get the numerical representation of that like text. Yep, that's right. And then you would have that as like just your X value in your data frame. Yep. Or so run yes, through? that's right. So this because I use the small library, um, each vector is a length of ninety six. Okay. Um, so your X will just have 96 columns. Okay, so each of these are going to be their own own column. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you basically your data frame will be like rows and rows of this. Okay, so you'd have 96 columns and then for each document you're going to have one of those. That's like the word representation, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then each one of your documents is still going to be a row, but just with like I guess the columns one through 96 filled in with the yeah. numerical representation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's your X. Yep. Okay. The one downside with doing this is if you do like feature importances, they will not mean anything. So yeah. just to get the most information to like, I don't know, back up whatever business case you're trying to make, um, I would recommend just doing at least one of which one of each so that you can extract you know information from like a tfidf or any bag of words method um, and then also with this just to see if context plays a role in improving your classification all right um any other questions about getting from like i guess like just vectorizing your text in general all right so uh, let me so just turn it do, a What would you do with this? You would then put this into a classification model? Yeah, that's right. You can actually take this and throw it into a classification model. So if you, you basically will have a data frame of like 96 columns and however many document number of rows, and then that will be your X that, um, that will go into your model. Okay, great. Awesome. So the last thing I want to talk about is um, the positive, negative to neutral thing that we were, that we were talking about. Um, so basically, um, and I know like both Andrew and Ali are dealing with these and basically any binary that is, that has like a middle ground, how can you determine these? Um, so if you're training a binary model, most models, like most of the machine learning models are able to give you a probability. So for example, let me see, just as an example, let's use, I don't know, random forest. So random forest, you have your predict proba. So with the predict proba, instead of giving you just straight up zero, one, it'll give you a number between zero and one. So with that, you can actually do a little bit of post modeling EDA. So for all of your test data points, um, you can extract this probability and plot it out and see what that distribution looks like. Um, I, it's hard to say what that distribution will look like, but based on the distribution, you might be able to say, all right, it looks like there is kind of like a neutral zone where you're getting a lot of probabilities of like, you know, maybe 40 to 60%. And then those, and again, based on that distribution, you would manually determine some threshold for it to be determined to for it to be classified as like neutral. So for example, if you have like one as positive, zero as negative, or vice versa, it doesn't matter. Anything in the middle, anything that gives you a probability of like 0.5, um, like for example, with 0.51, right? If you get a number of 0.51, it would, if you just look at like the dot predict, it'll automatically round it up to one and it'll be classified as let's just say one is positive automatically classify as positive. But you can see that, you know, it was just like a 1% difference that made it positive versus negative. So based on the outputs of predict proba, 
you will be able to determine some threshold. And this is again, depending on, um, on a little bit of post-modeling EDA, maybe plot a histogram of all the probabilities up to you to decide. And then once you've decide on, decided on this middle range, you can actually write something that instead of you know, outputting zero and one, output this, and then just based on the range of these ranges of these values, create your own third class. So yeah, that's actually, yeah, that's how you would do it for these models. So any tree model, I think even like naive Bayes does it too. Let me see. Naive Bayes. Anything that gives you, yeah, anything that gives you a probability of a prediction, um, you'll be able to do that. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit manual because you also don't want to, um, I mean, yeah, it'll be easier if there are like different peaks in the distribution of your probability. Uh, but again, it's very, very case by case, dependent on your data, dependent on, on your model as well. Um, so yeah, I would say I would only do that after I've decided on my final model um, and then determine these thresholds. But yeah, any further questions on that? What about neural networks? <laughs> neural networks, I think kind of similar too, right? Because in a neural network, let's say, I know you were talking about how yours had a sigmoid function. Yeah. So sigmoid function, if you look at, I think from your sigmoid, I think if you go one layer back, or if you output the exact weight of your sigmoid function, you will be able to see the probability as well. I forget which part of the neural network that is exactly, but you will be that you are definitely able to extract some probability um, at the end. So let, actually, let me just see. Keras, what should I look for? Hmm. Output probability. Here we go. So as an example, I don't know if this is a good example. So let's see. Uh, all right, maybe a different one. But it should be kind of similar because once you have a probability, you can just manually segment. So let's see. Is this what I... I know if you do like... Huh. I have to look for the exact thing, but I know that you can definitely get that information from Keras. Um, but I am stumped on what exactly to look up. Oh, okay, I guess, oh, wait, that's not an answer either. Oh, does Keras have predict Prabha? Let's see. Predict Prabha. Oh, cool. So looks like you can do the same with Keras using the same, the same name method as well. And then it should return you, um, yeah, it should return you. I forget if, if it's a sigmoid, I forget if it will give you like um, each result as like a two value array with just like the two values that sum up to one. Um, or just one number. I forget, it depends on the activation function. Uh, but yeah, as long as you have some probability, you can manually take all of the information and decide on your own boundaries. Yeah, because I, for now, I'm using the activation function of sigma for my output layer. So it should mm -hmm. be one number. Okay, yeah, then it should, then see if predict Krabba works for, for, your, with, for your network. I can't use it now because I designed my own network, but I'm planning on using RNN. Okay, cool. I will use that there All because right. I can apply it to my own class. Got it. All right, yeah, sounds good. Um, all right, we are right at time. I actually have one more one-on-one -on -one that I have to get to. Any like final questions before we end off? All right, so we meet again on Monday, I want to say. Yeah, I think it's Monday. All right. Yeah, I think I saw Monday. 
Yeah, Monday at 2 p.m., our usual study group, our, our usual study group time. So I will see you all then as well. I'll post something in Slack about this too. Thank all you. Right, then. Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck with your projects, everybody. Thanks. Bye.